I always want to give Charlie a high five and say tag I'm in or something when we come up to you in the front like that. One time we're going to do that. We're going to fist bump on the way back and say. There was a fourth grade teacher who had to step out of the room, out of her classroom for a few minutes. And when she came back, she found the students all sitting there really quiet and, and well behaved. And, and she was just shocked. And she said, I've never seen anything like this before. And she, she said, well, tell me, what came over all of you? Why are you all of a sudden so well-behaved and quiet? And she kind of probed, and nobody would answer. And finally, a little girl uh, raised her, and she spoke. She said, she said, well, one time you said that if you ever came back and found us quiet, you would just drop dead. <laughs> Guess they didn't really get what they were expecting. She kept teaching. Today we're going we're gonna to look at our, our journey, continue our journey through 1 Samuel. And uh, this is the, the end of our, our series of, of this. Uh, this particular section we're going to be looking at is uh, the chapters 28 uh, through the first chapter of 2 Samuel. Uh, and this section really brings out the, the theme of the, of the whole series of in, invoking the past and inviting the future more so than any other to me. And, and the question is, do we, do we fear the future... And, and try to conjure up one last vestige of the past in order to, to delay the future that we, that we know is coming? Or do we, do we memorialize, perhaps honor the past and, and, and try to let go of any bitterness and court the future that we know is, is coming? And so we, we need to remember that, that this book is, is, a, is one long book. In Hebrews, uh, it was one long book, the book of Samuel, and, and we split it into, in, into two books. And this particular part here is a, is a good split. It's a good climactic part where the, we have the death of Saul. It's kind of like two parts of a movie, right? Or, or like the intermission in the, in the, like the Gone with the Wind sagas, where you have a, a, a little climax that happens, and then you, you take a break and you, you continue. So that's kind of what we, we have here. And as we read through to the beginning of 2 Samuel in, in the first chapter there, we see two different responses and a contrast in how Saul and David are, are handling their past, crumbling into their new futures. So the last time we saw David, he was hanging out with the Philistines. He was in Philistine territory, and he was uh, preparing uh, with the Philistines. They were going to prepare to attack Israel. And so what we have here is we have Achish requesting David to come and to battle with me, and you're going to be my personal bodyguard. And so David and his men, they, they, go in, 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 they start going into battle with him. And meanwhile, Saul sees this troop buildup taking place there, and he gets afraid. That's Saul's kind of modus operandi, right? That he, he gets afraid, and, and he's trying to see what, what does God want him to do, but God's not answering. And so he tries a different tactic. He goes to uh, the witch of Endor. Now, this is something that he's outlawed himself, something that he's outlawed, something that God finds abhorrent. Uh, in Deuteronomy 18.14, outlaws contacting the dead, speaking to the dead. The, 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 the thing throughout the Bible is it talks about this as being spiritual corruption, something that is, is good for other nations but not for Israel. But its effectiveness in, in communicating is never denied. And we actually see this uh, in modern guys today, like the, the most famous guys, probably Jonathan Edwards, used to have a show on TV, trying to always contact the, the dead relatives of people. And this is appealing to people. It gives people a, a supernatural experience, a, a supernatural knowledge, without actually having any kind of commitment or connection to God. And so Saul, he's desperate, and he tries this. He goes to see this, this witch of Endor, what we would call a medium or a channeler today. He puts on a disguise, and he goes in there, and he orders this witch to call up Samuel, the prophet who for years had, had, had led Israel. And so the ghost of Samuel comes up, and the ghost of his past tells him exactly what he had told him already once before in his past, and then gives him a glimpse of his future. He says, the Lord has done just as he said he would. He has torn the kingdom from you and given it to your rival David. The Lord has done this to you today because you refuse to carry out the fierce anger against the Amalekites. What's more, the Lord will hand you and the army of Israel over to the Philistines tomorrow. And you and your sons will be here with me. The Lord will bring down the entire army of Israel in defeat. Now these words, if you were to look back, they're, they're eerily similar to the last time that he spoke. To Saul. Remember, he spoke to Saul one more time, and then they, they left. They never, they never talked again until this point here where he calls him back from the dead. These words are very similar to, to what he told him in chapter 15. 
And, and as if you're ever wondering about witchcraft and channeling, this, this is one indication that it's real. It's a real spiritual thing as we can see. It's, it's not something that, that, that God wants us to do. He conjures up Samuel here from the dead with this, with this witch. And Samuel does not have good news for him. He has grim news for him. Look, what I told you is going to happen is now starting to happen. And your future is going downhill. As a side note, the Hebrew word here... That's used for Samuel's ghost or for Samuel's spirit is the word Elohim. It's the Hebrew word Elohim. And, and, it, and it's also translated in the Bible as God or gods or divine beings. Uh, an indication, one of the many hints in the Old Testament to a, to a spiritual world with a lot of other spiritual beings going on in here. That there's a spiritual underworld that we really have, have not much uh, connection to that, 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 that affects our lives in many ways. So Saul here, he, he conjures up the past, conjures up the past in the wrong way, breaking God's law, breaking his own law, desperately trying to hold on to his past, to his power, trying to change this future that's breaking in on him. He's, he's refusing to learn from the mistakes of his past. He's holding on to bitterness. He's holding on to unforgiveness. He has not yet learned that our past affects the future, the kind of past that we invoke affects the kind of future that we're inviting in. And so meanwhile, this is going on. David is preparing to join the Philistines in the battle. And, and some of the commanders of Achish's army, the king's army, don't appreciate David's presence. And they say, King, we don't trust this guy. He cannot go into battle with us. What if he all of a sudden decides to turn against us? What if he decides that this is a good time to get back into the good graces of his king, Saul? They recognize something that maybe Akish is not seeing. In fact, back in chapter 14, several renegade Israelites did switch back to Israel when the, when the Philistines began to lose. So this is not something that's entirely unheard of for them. And they say, oh, we, we, just, we cannot go into battle with this guy. And so Akish has to say, okay, David, you need to go back home. Go back home. The commanders have rejected you. And so he heads back to Ziklag. This is all part of God's providence because he gets back to Ziklag. And he's working for David behind the scenes, a spiritual realm that sometimes we don't see. David gets back to his home in Ziklag and the Amalekites have come and burned up the town and taken their women and their children, their families hostage. The men are sad. To say the least. They are, they are weeping. Scripture says they weep until they could weep no more. And not only are they, they sad, but they're angry. They're angry at, 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 at who? They're mad at the, the raiders, the Amalekite raiders that came and took their people. No, now they're mad at David. They're mad at their leader. They're mad at the guy who said, let's go with Akish in the battle instead of staying here and protecting our families and protecting our homes. Now they're ready to just get rid of David. And David's future is in jeopardy now. Among all this mourning and all this bitterness, this uncertainty, this is David's response. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and their daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him. They're going to stone their leader, David. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it. Then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? Where does David get his strength from? Where does David get his strength from? The Lord. That's all right. You can answer. It's okay. Where's David? He gets his strength from the Lord. His, his life, his leadership are in peril. And the first thing he does is he goes directly to the Lord for guidance. He goes to find Abiathar the priest and says, what do I do, Lord? Now, this is a little different than what we saw in his, in his reaction to the, the situation last week. Last week with Nabal, right? A little bit different. His knee-jerk response was, let's go, let's go get him, let's, let's get our honor. Now, it was an honorable reaction. He, he was honorably insulted, and this is an honorable reaction too. They've taken his, his wife and his children. But now he's pausing for a moment. He's pausing and saying, what do I do, Lord? It's finding his strength in God, finding his guidance from the Lord. David is courting the future that God designs. Rather than, than conjuring up the past and, and trying to somehow prevent the, the future from happening, he, 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 he seeks God's approval. And he makes sure that he has God's favor in what he's about to do. 
He wants to know what the decision is for him as a leader and for him and his family. And so while we see Saul arranging a seance with a medium, David's calling for the ephod, calling for God's guidance. And God says, go get him. God says, go get him. You're, I, I bless this. Go rescue your family. And so they, they mount a rescue mission to go get them from the Amalekites. Now, what we have to realize here is that these men have just left the battlefield and returned to Ziklag. They've made a three-day journey of about 62 miles from where they were with the Philistines to where they are in Ziklag. So, they've gone about almost a marathon a day in battle gear and camping equipment on them. And now, their families and their, their women, their wives and their children are gone. So now, they're going to march again another 15 miles... And they get to this place called the Basor Ravine, and a third of his men, about 200 people, are tired. They're worn out. Wouldn't you be tired? You've done three marathons in three days. Now you're going even further, and you've got about 50 pounds worth of equipment, at least, carrying with you. And they're tired, and they're exhausted, and they can't go anymore. So, David decides to leave some of them behind, leave those guys behind. You guys watch the equipment, watch the weapons, and we'll continue on after our, our family and our our. our our, our wives. Again, we see David in this part courting even the gospel itself, the future, what he's doing here. Along the way, they come across a dying Egyptian. You got part of his force now has stayed back, and they come across this dying Egyptian on the road. And they meet this guy, and it's got a little bit like the, the Good Samaritan story. They meet this guy on the road, and they could have just kept kept going, right? Leave this guy be. We've got a mission. They're chasing down another army that has got a head start on them. And they have no idea how far they've gone. And they've been marching already for almost four days now. So do they leave the guy or do they help him? Well, they decide they're going to help him. They pull him aside. They help this Egyptian out. They feed him. They water him. They start talking to him. They find out this guy was with the raiding party that we're chasing down. So he gives them some intel. He says they're up here and they're scattered around and they're, they're celebrating with all of their goods and all of their spoils of war. And David and his men now have an opportunity to get to their families and to easily overtake the Amalekites. Now remember, David only has about 400 men. He's got a small little force. This Egyptian's intel is important for him to, to determine we can go in and we can take them out. And they do. They rescue all of their women and all of their children back and they destroy the Amalekite army. And they catch up to them and they take care of it. But David proves why he's a man after God's own heart. And he proves why, how he's courting the future even of the gospel itself in this encounter. They, they, they get back their, all their stuff after, after dealing with the Egyptian. In a, in a very honorable way, by the way, dealing with this Egyptian. They get all their stuff back and they head back to where they stopped with their guys who were camping out. They head back to the Besor Ravine. All right? Now, Besor, in Hebrew, it actually means good news. Or means gospel. Another way to put that, good news, gospel. So they get to this place, Besor, and the, the people who have gone and gotten all the stuff, gotten all their, rescued their family, they've gotten all the spoils of war from all from the Amalekites. And they get back and they want to keep it. They say, these guys have been sitting here doing nothing. We want to keep all the stuff. They don't deserve any of it. Well, this is what David says. He says, no, my brothers, don't be selfish with what the Lord has given us. He has kept us safe and helped us defeat the band of raiders that attacked us. Who will listen when you talk like this? We share and share alike, those who go to battle and those who guard the equipment. See, at Besor, at the, 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 at the good news, we see the foreshadowing of the gospel, where, where everyone is equal to receive Christ's salvation, where the, he came for the whole world, not just the people who did the good stuff, not just the people who, who think they're good enough to receive it. No. He's for everybody, came for everybody, and, and God is the one. Notice David's response here. God is the one who wins the victory. God is the one who wins the victory. God is the one who connected them with the Egyptian slave to give them the intel. God is the one who allowed them to, to defeat an enemy with greater numbers. God is the one who gave them all of those things that they are now sharing amongst themselves as a family. You see, our faith is not what saves us. Our faith is a response to the saving that Christ has already done. Our faith is a response to his regeneration and his justification. He wins the victory. 
And notice, David also here in this chapter, he courts the future in another way as well. They will return to Ziklag, all equal, all sharing all of their things together. In fact, he tells them, no one is more important. They're guarding the equipment. and Their gift and their talent of guarding the equipment is just as important as what you did over here. Kind of reminiscent of what we see in 1 Corinthians 12, right? We all have gifts, and we all uh, uh, contribute to the body of Christ. But David, they return to Ziklag. And he takes a part of all of these spoils and he sends some to the elders of Judah, the only tribe that will accept him as a king for seven and a half years. Sort of greasing the wheels, right? Sort of paving the way. He sends these in part uh, as gratitude for the support that they've already given him. And in and, and part as he's known that his kingship is approaching, right? And, and the result is that he's going to have a time where he's going to have some friends. And he's going to have some people who support him. So he uses that as an opportunity now. So here we have David courting the future, even courting the future of the, of the gospel itself here. And over here we've got the Philistines and Israel battling it out. And during the battle, King Saul is mortally wounded. Mortally wounded by a Philistine archer. And it says Saul groaned. He says, take your sword and kill me. Before these pagans come and run me through and taunt me and torture me. But his armor bearer wouldn't do it. He wouldn't kill him. He refused to murder a man in cold blood. So Saul takes his own sword and he falls on it. Now, Saul the king is dead on the battlefield. His sons Jonathan and another one of his sons will also die on the battlefield. And the Philistines do find the body. Find the body of Saul and they take it as a trophy and they hang it up. On their wall saying, look at what we've done, humiliating him. Eventually, the men from his hometown of Jabesh Gilead will rescue him and will rescue that body and will take it and give it an honorable burial of a king. Years later, David will, will get the remains of Saul and Jonathan and give them a burial in their own family burial plot. So this is Saul's downfall. He's dead. The king, the God's anointed king is gone. Now, David gets this news on the other side of the wilderness. He's not in the battle. He's still in Ziklag. And an Amalekite guy runs up and has a message for David. He says, Saul is dead, and I killed him. Now we shift into 2 Samuel. Saul dies at the end of the last chapter of 1 Samuel. 2 Samuel begins with David getting the news that Saul is now dead. The Amalekite comes, and he says, I found Saul in the battle, and I killed him. And here's his crown. I took some of his stuff. Now, we as the reader know that this guy's wrong. We know that he's a con man. He's just trying to get what he can, right? Because we know that's not what happened. We just read that Saul killed himself, fell on his sword. This guy's trying to, trying to get something. He's thinking, maybe David will give me a reward. This is the enemy of the king. He'll give me something good for killing King Saul. But David, David takes a, a different approach. David executes the Amalekite. For killing God's anointed king. And David is very consistent in this regard. Later on in 2 Samuel 4, when Saul's only son, Ishbosheth, is assassinated, David will take out vengeance on the guys who assassinated King Ishbosheth. He does not think that God's anointed king should be attacked. That's God's design, that's God's thing to take care of. By the way, it's ironic. But the Amalekites are so present throughout this whole story. Have you noticed that, how, how much they're present in this story? That the Amalekites were part of the reason of Saul's downfall. He, they were the reason Saul failed to destroy them, and they were the reason he eventually fell. The Amalekites were the ones involved in giving David the opportunity to, to grease the wheels so with some future allies. They were the ones who raided his, his party. And now here, an Amalekite is executed for Saul's murder. God cares for and uses all nations of peoples. All nations of peoples for his purpose. Back to David. David's wise. David's wise even in the way that he courts the future here. David knows that he is the rightful king. Has been for quite a while. He was anointed by God to be the rightful king. But he will refuse to be a king seen as a usurper. He refuses to be seen as the one who just takes over the throne. He is God's king. And he will take the throne in God's timing. So, 
He's been king for a long time, but now he's got his opportunity. Saul is finally dead, and we have David can step in and say, Yay! Right? Saul's dead. We rejoice. Some of us will read all this and we go, Whew, finally. Right? We get through all of 1 Samuel and Saul's been chasing him around and doing all these bad things and lying to him. And we go, whew, sigh of relief. Right? He's finally dead. That's not what David does. David, of all people, has the right to do that. Yes, he's finally dead. I can take my rightful place. But that's not what David does here. While David courts the future, he's also immediately mourning Saul. He writes a funeral dirge. He writes a, an ode to Saul and Jonathan. He conjures up the mighty exploits of the past of Saul and Jonathan before he moves forward to take his kingdom. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Your glory, referring to Saul. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, so the daughters of Philistine won't rejoice. The song begins and ends with how the mighty have fallen. Nowhere in this song does David talk about Saul's weaknesses, his failures, his bad judgment, his jealousy, his bitterness, the fact that he chased him around the wilderness, the fact that he took his wife, the fact that he kept trying to kill him. Nowhere. Nowhere. In fact, he says, treat this news of the king's death with reverence, with the reverence it deserves. In our modern day speak, it would be turn off the cameras, stop the media frenzy, and let the family have some respect and some privacy. He celebrates the bravery of these two leaders. He says again, how beloved and gracious were Saul and Jonathan. They were together in life and in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. How the mighty have fallen. David calls the community to mourn, to remember the mighty deeds of God's anointed king for all the things he did do for the community, for all the things he did do for his country. A sense of loss coupled with the achievement of two great warriors. While Saul reached back into the past in the wrong way to try to salvage his future with the witch of Endor, David conjures up the past of God's king who deserves respect and who deserves mourning no matter how much we disagree with what he did or what he's doing. He shows us how to conjure the past and court the future in the right way, that we must respectfully put to death bitterness and the hurts of the past before moving on. Remember, David had right more than anybody to cheer on Saul's death. He had the right to say, yes, his reign is finally at an end. Saul had used all of his executive powers as king inappropriately throughout his reign. And yet, David understands that the past that we invoke affects the future that we invite. What happened if he had badmouthed Saul and said, yes, he's dead, he's gone, his reign is finally over, good riddance, get him out of here, on with you, out the door, don't let it hit you on the way out. What if he had said that? Well, he starts his reign off on a sour, bitter note. Perhaps he isolates some of the people who supported Saul. Saul's entire tribe of Benjamin, guys from Jabesh Gilead, had gone and rescued his body. Perhaps he doesn't garner the support of those people. And he starts off his kingdom on a bad way. Forgiveness and respect are paramount as we learn to shift from what we view as a golden age into an unknown future. And so as we end this series on past and future, let me return to the climactic death of Saul. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's been said that everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. That these stories, what we read, are our teachers, our schoolmasters. So what does a seemingly unsuccessful king like Saul point to Jesus. Well, just a few similarities. One, Saul takes out his own sword and he falls on it, has a, what is, amounts to a, a defeat, a death defeat, shameful death. We know too Jesus is killed by his enemies, body strung up on a cross. All people who want to pass by and laugh and mock at him, his mission was ultimately seen as a failure. Saul's too, a shameful death and a failure. The remains of Saul's army are scattered. After he dies, the it, it, Philistines come in and they take over the towns. Jesus, too, his disciples desert him. They leave him. They run. They run and hide. Jesus' army is scattered. 
That isn't the end. As dishonorable as Saul's death was, we've mentioned already that the men of Jabesh Gilead went and rescued his body and took it off and gave him an honorable burial. Much like Joseph of Arimathea goes and takes Christ's body off the cross and gives it an honorable burial fit for a king. So we've got some similarities that point towards Jesus and toward his crucifixion. But that's about where the, where the similarities end. While Saul's death is an end, and he's a relic of the past, his kingdom is scattered and fearful, Jesus' death is not only not, not the end at all, it's a beginning. It's a beginning of a much more glorious future that we have. In fact, all the kings, all the kings, all the relics of the past are shadows of the future. But Jesus is the king of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our past, our present, and our future are solid and secure in his hands. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for reminding us of how to uh, grab a hold of forgiveness and to grab a hold of uh, our, our past and to let go of some things, Lord, that hold on to us. And to invite a new future where we rely on you, where we uh, give our lives over to you. And we know, Lord, that you are holding us. That you are holding us even in the darkest times. That you are uh, preparing a place for us. And that you have a refuge for us underneath the shadow of your wings. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit will embolden us and will allow us, Lord, to take... Uh, Action that when we when we hear, Lord, that we uh, can believe in you and can step up and obey you, that we will do that, whatever that may look like. Thank you so much for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.